Hello, this is Ewan again. Uh, today we will we'll be looking at a target that was photographed in hydrogen and oxygen. In oxygen, that is that actually describes the channels that the image is created from: hydrogen going in red, oxygen going in green, and in blue. Um, why should you choose one of these targets? Well, because they're rich in oxygen and they're also rich in hydrogen. A lot of these don't have a lot of sulfur, so sulfur being collected as a channel will not make any sense. Feel free to Google how the network nebula that we're looking at today looks in the Hubble palette or sulfur, hydrogen, oxygen versus hydrogen, oxygen, oxygen, and you'll see what I mean. Um, I love this target. I've imaged it many times with a one-shot color camera or what you would call a regular DSLR with different focal lengths, different telescopes, had different results. This by far is probably one of my best images of that target and of this dual channel, um, du dual color uh, combination image. So let's take a look at how, how I captured the image. What are some of the kind of artifacts I had to work with? And let's see if it's a good image. So let's move on to fix sight. The telescope I use is the telescope on the right. It's the same uh, as the one in the Eagle Nebula video, the video, the Officina Stellare Ricci Cretian 12 and a half inch um, telescope. It has a 12 and a half inch mirror. It is a very, very good telescope. But when I got it, it was considered to be a lemon or a dead telescope because of a baffle that was installed for older, less sensitive sensors, um, this telescope had what it looked like spherical aberration or some kind of opt optical problems that would cost a lot to fix. But I was very excited when I got it. It's also very, very hard to collimate. Uh, my friend Jim is the person who figured this out. His crazy collimation techniques is what got it to uh, where this telescope is today, and he also rebuilt the spider veins to remove the baffle. Um, it is not a, a light telescope. It weighs, in total, all of this weighs around 80 pounds. As you can see, three counterweights and an extension shaft doesn't make it really an easy to use telescope. But if you kind of work with it, learn its pluses and minuses, it is a it is really a professional grade telescope. I use a dew shield because my neighbors have really powerful lights and because of the humidity in California can damage your optics and damage um, some of the parts on the telescope, the mechanical parts. So I try to avoid uh, getting the telescope wet if I, can't, if I can help it. I have a computer at the back that downloads, downloads all the information. Uh, this is the first setup I had with the ZWO 6200. I actually use a QHY600 right now because of the superior build and the different modes. So let's look at the images and see what I had. Now, let me start with one single hydrogen image and one single oxygen image. Let's see what we have there. So this is one single oxygen frame and this is one single hydrogen frame. Now, except the actual uh, hot and cold pixels, the data is actually really good. There's a little bit of vignetting, but it really happens with most telescopes. This is an f5.4 telescope, so it's quite fast, and vignetting is a is a result of that. Um, the data is there. This is a binned image, which means it's half the resolution, and through software, it increases the signal output to about three times. It's not a CCD, so it's not as good, but the data speaks for itself. Now, as you can see in the hydrogen channel, which is a little bit brighter, you can start seeing these concentric circles. The light was dispersed by this baffle and created this kind of ripple effect. Um, to fix it, if it would be an optical uh, thing, it would have cost more than the telescope would new because it, it, it just, it's a lot of hassle to get new mirrors. So I actually thought it might be something else. I collected 19 hours of hydrogen and six and a half hours of oxygen 
the reason I connected, I collected so much hydrogen is my friend Robert from Telescope Express imaged this with a Rasa and he captured this really beautiful wisp uh, and I wanted to see if I can do it as well. It took me 19 hours, but I got there. Now the data is very clean. There's not a lot of noise. The detail and the wispiness of this, this particular object really makes it worthwhile imaging in hydrogen, oxygen, and oxygen. Now here's where the problem started to appear. And it was, it was a bit of a pain in the behind because the more you stretch the image, the more you process it, the more these kind of get bigger and more obvious. So they're there on relatively big stars and they did not go away as easily. But let's see if I actually created a decent image, even though these artifacts and the telescope was not perfect, which is most of our uh, equipment. Now, I did a lot to this image. I stacked it, I deconvoluted it, then I did some work on the stars to understand if the deconvolution worked perfectly. So I think it took me four times to get the proper deconvolution algorithm. Um, after I stacked it, I decided to decompose the channel, work on the luminous channel again. It took me a long time. I think I spent about six or seven hours processing this information to get it to the detail that I wanted to. Um, but after the luminance channel was created through a synthetic uh, SHO script where I used 60% hydrogen and 40% oxygen, we got to a level of detail and nebulosity that I really liked. Um, now let's look at those annoying concentric circles. Let's see if they're still a problem or if at least they uh, they're presenting an issue. They're not. They're still there. They're hard to see, but no telescope is perfect, even the most expensive ones. This telescope new cost a lot, and I took a big risk buying it, and my friend Jim recollimated it, rebuilt the spider veins, did a lot of work to it, probably about 20 hours worth of mechanical and collimation work, but results speak for themselves. It is a professional grade telescope, and because a lot of us look at raw frames and make conclusions based on that and think, oh, this is not perfect, so the end result must be bad, it tends to creep on you and kind of make you go and try to recollimate it or try to find the problem and fix it. My advice is to anybody, collect data, stack it, process it. Sometimes you can't even see it. And if you have a fast telescope, you'll know what I mean with tilt in the corners. But the image looked really good. The starless image, this is where I think the issues uh, uh, that I was describing with the concentric circles left dot stamps in the background. They were pretty obvious, as you can see, like little supernovas, although there were no supernovas. And it's kind of hard to make a good starless image and to kind of remove these out. It's not impossible, but it takes time. So. One of the things I did is, because this is a binned image, it's half the resolution of the camera, so I decided to upscale it using uh, Topaz. So the final result is, for me, impressive for something I took from my backyard with a telescope that was pronounced dead and pronounced uh, a paperweight. So this is the star, uh, the image with the stars. The detail is very, very good. The wispiness is there. The hydrogen wisp that Robert captured is also in my image, but because the aperture is a little bit bigger, I can even see this beautiful hydrogen and oxygen dance of nebulosity here. I think it's really beautiful, and I think it's impressive that uh, we can capture this from a suburb in a Portal 7 sky. Um, the starless image, though, needed some fixing you see a lot of stamps and dots and weird little things artifacts coming from those concentric circles so i actually took it in photoshop and i cleaned it up and then as a result it's it's not perfect it will never be perfect because i'll have to select most of the background and try to work on it and that would be fake there's still nebulosity in here like you can see 
here there's some a lot of hydrogen there's a little bit of oxygen I did not want to remove those I can see the wisp even better now and um, I am actually really happy with this image I like the starless image but I think the uh, image with the stars for me stands out a lot my advice is um, you have to image you have to use your equipment to learn it to learn its its flaws to learn its its value and in time you can take excellent images even with telescopes that were pronounced dead um, now one of the things uh, I will say is my next video will be of the Horset Nebula. This shows when it's really necessary to do a starless image because of the star field, because of um, maybe some lights that you have to deal with. Again, I have neighbors that have really bright lights. The faster the telescope, the worse it gets. Um, if you like my videos, if you like my images, feel free to contact me on social media, comment in the videos. If you have any suggestions or feedback on some of these images, I would love to hear it. And yeah, if you like the content I produce, don't forget to subscribe and see you in the next video.